eight for work and pensions. Secretary Estimate Vay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This government is delivering the biggest changes to the welfare state in a generation. We are building a benefit system fit for the 21st century, helping more people into work by providing tailored support and more financial support for the most vulnerable. These changes are designed to not only reflect the technological age we live in, which is having a significant impact on work and communications, but also to reflect people's working lives. We are providing extra support for childcare costs and offering flexibility to look after children or elderly parents. Our reforms take into account flexible working, self-employment, multiple jobs, the gig economy and societal changes, in particular the growing awareness of mental health conditions, which is strongly linked to the changing pace of life and the barrage of constant communications. And we are succeeding in our aim to reshape the system and provide for the most vulnerable. So far, Mr Speaker, we have supported nearly 3.4 million more people into work since 2010. That's over 1,000 people a day, every day since 2010, producing a record rate of people into work and the lowest unemployment level since the 1970s. And we are also spending £54 billion on benefits to support disabled people and people with health conditions. This is up £9 billion since 2010. We are also supporting a record 600,000 disabled people enter work over a four-year period. Universal credit is a brand new benefit system. It is based on leading edge technology and agile working practices. Our strategy is based on continuous improvement, listening, learning and adapting our delivery as the changes roll out across the country. The result will be a tailor-made system based on the individual. This is a unique example of great British innovation. And, Mr Deputy Speaker, we are leading the world in developing this kind of person-centred system. Countries like New Zealand, Spain, France, Canada have met with us to see Universal Credit, to watch and learn what is happening for the next generation of benefit system. And let's not forget, we are introducing this system because the legacy regime it replaces was outdated, not only in terms of an ageing IT infrastructure, that was built in the 1980s, but also in the way it trapped people in unemployment and disincentivised work. Today I'm updating the House on the changes we have made to universal credit as a result of this iterative approach that we are taking. That is why last autumn we introduced uh, and we abolished the seven-day waiting days from the application process. We put in place the two-week housing benefit run-on to smooth the transition for an applicant moving to UC from the previous system. We ensured that advance payments could be applied uh, from day one for an application process, and that was up to 100% of a person's indicative total claim. And we extended extended the recovery period for these advances to 12 months. Extra training was given to our work coaches to embed these changes. Prior to this, we changed the UC telephone lines to a free phone number to ensure ease of access for claimants inquiring about their claim. And earlier this year, we reinstated housing benefit for 18 to 21-year-olds, and we ensured two kinship carers are exempt from tax credit changes. And just last week, we announced changes to support the severely disabled when they transition onto UC. Within our reforms, we want to ensure that the most vulnerable get the support they need. These are proactive changes taken to enhance our new benefit system. Our mod- Applications to UC have been made alongside significant changes to personal independence payments to reflect the government's support for disabled people and all types of disabilities, unlike the system before it, which focused on physical disabilities. In fact, Within week one of me entering this job, I took the decision not to continue with the historic appeal regarding a High Court judgment on the PIP amending regulations in order to support people suffering from overwhelming psychological distress. We have also committed to video recording PIP assessments so that everyone involved can be sure of their fair and reviewable outcome. And earlier this week, we announced a more practical approach to assessing claimants with severe degenerative diseases. Those patients 
patients receiving the highest awards will no longer require to attend regular face-to-face interviews in order to repeatedly verify their difficult and debilitating circumstances. I would like now to to turn to the report on universal credit published last week by the National Audit Office, which did not take into account the impact of our recent changes. Our analysis shows that universal credit is working. We already know it helps more people into work and stay in work than the legacy system. Universal Credit has brought together six main benefits which were administered by different local and national government agencies. Once fully rolled out, it will be a single streamlined system, reducing administration costs and providing value for money for all our citizens. The cost per claim has already reduced by 7% since March 2018 and is due to reduce to £173 by 24-25. This is around £50 less per claim than the legacy cases currently costs us to to process. Beyond the time span of the NAO report, we have greatly improved our payment timelines. Around 80% of claimants are paid on time after their initial assessment period. When new claims are not paid in full and on time, two-thirds have been found to have some form of verification outstanding. And verification is a necessary part of any benefit system. And citizens expect these measures to be in place. place we need to ensure we are paying the right people the right amount of money. Upon visiting job centres, the NAO observed good relations between work coaches and claimants. The results, we are saying, are thanks to the exceptional hard work of our work coaches that they put in day in, day out with claimants. UC is projected to help 200,000 people into work, adding £8 billion per year to the economy when it's fully rolled out. These are Conservative estimates based on robust analysis that have been signed off by the Treasury. And at a user level, we know 83% of universal credit claimants are happy with the service they receive. In conclusion, Mr Deputy Speaker, we are building an agile, adaptable system fit for the 21st century. We want people to reach their potential regardless of their circumstances or background, and we will make changes when required in order to achieve this ambition. I commend this statement to the House. Margaret Green. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I would like to thank the Secretary of State for advance sight of this statement. However, we on these benches believe she should have come to the House on Monday to make a statement to the House, both on the damning report of the National Audit Office, which was published on Friday, and the Government's decision to put back the target for completion of universal credit by another year, the sixth such delay which the Government announced last Thursday. Rather than taking pride in not continuing with an appeal on PIP regulations, she should reflect on her department being forced by legal challenges four times in the last year to review payments to disabled people. Universal Credit is this Government's flagship social security programme. The report on it by the NOA published on Friday is damning indeed. It concludes that Universal Credit is a major failure of public policy, it is failing to achieve its aims and as it stands there is no evidence it ever will. The report suggests that universal credit may cost more to administer than the benefit system that it replaces and concludes that it has not delivered value for money, it is certainly uncertain it ever will, and that it will never be able to measure whether it has achieved its stated goal. The Trussell Trust recently reported that food bank referrals have increased by 52% in areas where the full service of universal credit has been introduced in the past year, compared to 13% across the uh, UK as a whole. In Hastings, food bank referrals went up by 80% following the rollout of the full service. DWP does not measure whether claimants are experiencing hardship. Isn't it time she woke up to the realities of poverty in the UK and instructed her department to do so? 60% of claimants have asked for advance payments, showing just how high the level of need that is out there is. The Secretary of State says universal credit is based on leading edge technology and agile working practices. However, the NAO report says 38% percent of claimants were unable to verify their identity online and had to go to a job centre to do so. It makes no sense to accelerate the rollout of universal credit at the same time as rapidly closing job centres. The NAO report reveals that a significant number of people struggle to make and manage their claim online. DWP's own survey found that nearly half of claimants were unable to make a claim online unassisted and a fifth of claims are falling at an early stage because claimants are not able to navigate the online system. The Government claims that the introduction of universal credit will result in 200,000 more people finding long-term work than under legacy benefits. 
It repeatedly cites evidence from 2014-15, but this was before the cuts to work allowances were introduced and covers only single unemployed people without children. If one looks at the range of claimants in areas where universal credit has been rolled out, there is no evidence that universal credit is helping more people find long-term work. Delays in payments are pushing people into debt and rent arrears on such a scale that private and even social landlords are becoming increasingly reluctant to rent to universal credit claimants. Uh, the NAO report also points out that 20% of claimants are not being paid in full on time and over 1 in 10 are not receiving any uh, payment on time. The people who are most at need from the social security system are the ones most likely to have to wait for payments. A quarter of carers, over 30% of families who need support for childcare, and most shockingly of all, two-thirds of disabled people are not being paid in full and on time. The report points out that the Department doesn't expect the timeliness of the payments to improve over the course of this year, and that the Department believes that it is unreasonable for all claimants to expect that all that they be paid on time because of the need to verify each claim. Does the Secretary of State find the expectations of her own department acceptable? She has made some claims that things have improved greatly since the closure of the report. So will she put that information in the library to substantiate her claims? The impact of universal credit on some of our most vulnerable people are clear. Universal support is supposed to help people with this, but funding is severely limited and provision is patchy. What assessment has the Secretary of State made of it? Is she satisfied that her department is doing enough to support people who are struggling? The universal credit was supposed to offer personalised support to claimants, but stressed and overloaded staff are often failing to identify vulnerable claimants, yet DWP is aiming to increase the workloads of work coaches fourfold and case managers nearly sixfold as the government tries to cut the cost of universal credit still further. The NAO is very clear that DWP should not expand universal credit until it is able to cope with business as usual. The government must now listen to the NAO. It must stop the rollout of universal credit and fix the flaws before any more people are pushing it, pushed into poverty by a benefit that is meant to protect them from it. Universal credit is having a devastating impact on many people and will reach 8.5 million people by 2420 the Secretary of State must now wake up to the misery being caused by her policy. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, first off, I'd like to say that this was the earliest I could come to the House and make an oral statement, because I came and sought it as soon as possible, and that's why I'm here today. Everybody will know what has been happening this week in the House. Um, and when we're talking about the legal changes that I took, as I said, I took them from day one. I took them immediately. No one was forced to do that. I actually took it on myself with the rest of my team and also, I will say, with the rest of our MPs on this benches who came and told me what they would like to do. And I also went out and visited uh, various uh, groups up and down the country and I felt that was the best thing that we could do. Um, and when we talk about the cost of this system, fully rolled out, it will be £50 cheaper per claim. It is about an automated system, it is about a personal tailored system and for those people who can't get access or not sure about the IT and how to support it we put an extra 200 million pounds going to local authorities to support people to help them with IT to help them with debt not that you'd ever uh, recognize that from the scaremongering from the opposite side there and when i look at uh, they talk about poverty figures. When we look at poverty figures, compared to 2010, when they were last in office, there are now one million fewer people in absolute poverty. Yeah. Rates of material deprivation for children and pensioners have never been lower. Yeah. Inequality has fallen and remains lower than in 2010. And if you look at the latest figures out this week, inequality actually, because of our benefits, and tax changes have reduced 
by two thirds in the last year. I wish they would keep up to the rapidly changing of things that are happening. And we also talk about we are helping more people into work. Again, we know over 3.2 million more people in work. How much evidence you, do you need, for heaven's sake? We know it's a thousand jobs every day since 2010. Support is there. Now we put advances there. And it was key that we made those changes in the last budget. We knew if people were having difficulty with this benefit, which was there to support people, we had to make those changes. And that was about advances. That was about having a two-weekly run-on for their housing benefit. Uh, That was about stopping those waiting days. That is key. And now we're finding out 4% of people are moving quicker into work at six months. 50% of people spend more time looking for work. These are the realities of life. And what I will do, Mr Deputy Speaker, Please allow me just to do these, because these are real people who I meet and speak to. And this is what they are saying about universal credit. Shafiq was homeless, and he said, I got an advance that got me temporary accommodation, got me into a better place to look for work. And you know what? It just helped me out so much, I would have been lost without it. He's now in a job. Lisa said an advance payment helped me secure a place with my childcare provider. I'm paying it back over 12 months, but this has meant a great deal to me. Gemma, a lone parent, said it is amazing being able to claim for all my, nearly all my childcare costs. It's a real incentive to go out to work. I am going to be better off each week. Ben in Devon had a working coach, how it had helped him progress in work. From day one, his work coach had helped him. Ryan from Essex, a lack of work experience, a lack of confidence. His work coach helped him through universal credit. I will end it there with the people who are using the benefits. Duncan. Uh, Speaker, can I uh, uh, thank my right honourable friend for uh, her statement? Can I also say that I have to say the NAO report, I think, is frankly a shoddy piece of work. Uh, It has simply failed to take... No, genuinely, anyone that reads it, and I don't know if they do bother to read it on the other side, uh, the reality is that anybody that reads it realises they fail to take account of a whole series of issues, not least of which were the Treasury signed off figures about savings, eight billion recurring a year, and more importantly, the changes made last December, November, were actually have made a huge difference to people's lives. I would urge her to carry on and say to the Public Accounts Committee they really do need to ask the question. Who really polices this policeman? Because this piece of work does them no credit at all. I would ask her simply, now can she place her efforts on universal support to make sure that every council area delivers the extra bit that's supposed to go alongside universal credit? I want to thank my right honourable friend who has done more than most people in this House to support people into work. And what he is doing now is emphasising the point of that universal support, 200 million that local councils have got that should be helping people with debt management, with IT, and that is one thing we're definitely doing it. And equally, he raised an important point about the NAO report, and I'm sure the opposite benches haven't read it because it doesn't say stop the rollout. It says continue with the rollout and do it faster. Please read about stuff before talking about it. Kirsty Blight. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I'd like to thank the Secretary of State for advance sight of the statement. The National Audit Office report was absolutely damning in its criticism of yep. universal credit. And I'm honestly surprised that anybody on the government side would stand up and say that they do not agree with the National Audit Office. Oh, this is yeah. what they do. They audit things. This is, this is, their, this is their role. But actually, Mr Deputy Speaker, I shouldn't be surprised right this one. because the government has got form right this on this. One. Just like in the, when the UN report came forward so in terms weird. of the rights of disabled people, the government minister stood up and said, problem, what problem? There's no problem here. They're trying to do exactly the same thing over this report. Yep. It is clear in the National Audit Office report that, it's, that it says that it's not clear that universal credit will ever cost less to administer than the existing benefit system. The Department will never be able to measure whether universal credit actually leads to 200,000 more people in work. Um, the, I, I, universal credit, Mr Deputy Speaker, is pushing families into poverty and hardship. If you take this report... 
in conjunction with the Joseph Rowntree Foundation report, which talks about damningly criticising the sanctions regime and how dreadful it is for individuals. When you take it into account alongside the Trussell Trust report, which talks about the number of people who are seeking, needing to go to food banks in the areas where universal credit has been rolled out. Mr Deputy Speaker, later this year, universal credit will be rolled out in my constituency. I am worried for my constituents. I expect, as many others across the House have seen, a massive increase in the number of people coming through my door facing financial hardship. It is already the case that my office refers one person to a food bank every fortnight in Scotland's third city because of the actions of this Tory government. Yeah. Mr Deputy Speaker, the government can no longer bury its head in the sand about this and it needs to live up to these failings and make changes to improve the system. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Deputy uh, Speaker. What we've said quite clearly here, and I think it needs to be put on the record, this report was out of date and it did not take into account the significant changes that we have done. The ones in the budget were worth about one and a half billion. The ones that are coming forward are worth several billion. It hasn't taken that into account. What we do know are what genuine people who are getting the support from the work coaches are say, saying it's transformed our lives. So I would like to extend an invitation to the Honourable Lady to go into a job centre, to meet with her coaches, to say how revolutionary this is. And then another further point. Should the Honourable Lady not agree with this, she, as well as I know, she has got considerable powers in Scotland to change the welfare system, and should they wish to do it, they could, but they are not. Deputy Speaker, um, like a number of members, I am disappointed that the NAO's report does not take account of the changes that the Department made in response to the Work and Pensions Select Committee's recommendations last year. Um, uh, however, um, I, and I, I believe that the changes that were made uh, by the Secretary of State were part of a test and learn environment which is essential to the future success of universal credit. Will she commit to continue with test and learn and as part of that look at the recommendations made by the Select Committee on universal credit and self-employment? My honourable friend is right, and again, he's somebody who spent a considerable time investigating what we do and also providing uh, solutions and support in what we do. And you're right, it is about test and learn, and that's why I've focused it very much that way. Whether it is people who are self-employed or whether it is people who are disabled, that is what we will do. But just let me read uh, some quotes from various charity groups who have agreed in exactly what we've done. So shelter here when I made the decision along with my uh, honourable uh, friend there for the 18 to 21, said we're thrilled with the decision of what you have taken. Uh, talk about the budget changes, citizens' advice. Gillian Guy, chief executive, said this is a significant difference to millions of people who will be claiming a universal credit. If only the NAO had read her words and done their documents accordingly. Debbie Abrahams. I, I cannot believe what I'm hearing from the government, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. They are in absolute denial, not just about this report. Over the last six months, there have been not one, not two, but three High Court decisions or tribunal rulings, um, which have said that the government's actions with regard to PIP, and most recently in relation to severely disabled people transitioning onto UC, are discriminatory and unlawful. They have been made to change. But yesterday, the Minister for Disabled People said in a Westminster Hall debate that there was nothing unlawful or discriminatory about the government's actions. Doesn't this just reflect what the UN called as a disconnect between the lived experience of disabled people and this government's policies? And what is the Secretary of State doing to ensure that the implementation of all her policies recognise these judgments? Here, here. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Again, I would ask the Honourable Lady to read that court judgment because, actually, I'd made the decisions before with the disability premium and, actually, they did not 
ask for the government to alter that on the severe disability premium. It was not the point of law because we won on that point of law. So I'd ask the lady to read it uh, and, and uh, read it and digest it properly. And again, what I would say, the extra support that we've put in financially to health and disability has been £9 billion to support people. And in the last couple of years, we've got an extra 600,000 disabled people into work. That's what about. We are supporting the most vulnerable and helping more people into work. £3.2 million over that, but also 600,000 disabled people. So stop scaremongering. And should people have difficulties, please will you assist them so they can get the best support they need. That's what people are doing this side of the House, and that are where these figures are reflecting. Nigel Mills. The Select Committee this morning went to Marylebone Job Centre to see work coaches who were actually genuinely excited about the rollout which took place yesterday of UC. And I hope to find the same in my own constituency tomorrow morning. Would you agree key to making this work is that work coaches have the skills, the training, the time and the access to outside support they need to give claimants the support they need to get ready for work? That is exactly right. They will get and they have got more training. People are talking about work coaches with a renewed enthusiasm about the support that they are getting. Here we've got Darren from Wales. He was put on a confidence course, actually, because we were utilising our flexible fund. He said, my work coach was fantastic. Help me turn my life around, fulfilling a lifelong dream. That is what this is about, turning people's lives round. And please, please go and visit and meet with your work coaches because they too feel liberated for the first time ever to be helping people into work. Ruth George. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Um, I hope that the Secretary of State has also read and digested the uh, Universal Credit Full Service Survey from her very own department of over a thousand claimants, who, and that is as damning, if not more so, than the National Audit Office report, saying that 40% of claimants are in real financial hardship after nine months on Universal Credit. Only half felt better off with more work, and only half could claim unassisted. In light of that that report and all the other evidence in front of us. Please will the Secretary of State listen to the National Audit Office's recommendation that the programme does not expand before it can deal with higher claimant volumes. We have 100,000 people a month rolling onto Universal Credit this year, 200,000 a month next year. It will affect 4 million families from the end of next year and they must not have 40% in hardship. This is the same report that actually said people were getting into work quicker, they were staying in work longer, they were actually progressing in work better. It's also the same report that said people in work were actually getting £600 more a month through the support we're doing. It is the same report that also focused on the 16-hour benefit rule, which showed that people on the old legacy system were locked out of work, showing that there will be and enable people to now work 100 113 million extra hours a year because they're not locked on benefits. Mr Deputy Speaker, um, can I actually thank my right honourable friend and her fellow ministers for listening to suggestions to improve universal credit and welfare assessments and mention specifically the introduction of video recording for work capability PIP assessments and (coughs) could she possibly update me on the rollout of that video recording? I want to thank my honourable friend because she has done so much in this area and she has seen me so often to talk about what she thinks would be considerable improvements and one of them was this, video recording. How do we give people confidence in the system? How do we get transparency in the system? And that is now why we've now said we'll do that. Over the summer, what we'll be doing is uh, testing and learning, and we're also working with disabled people to say, do you feel more confident with this? Is video recording what you want? But we've made a commitment to improve this through recording. 
Speaker, I too was at the Marylebone Job Centre as part of the DWP Select Committee inquiry into benefit sanctions. Given that the Secretary of State seems open to suggestions, can I suggest to her that she reviews the policy on sanctions where a claimant can be sanctioned if they refuse a zero hour contract? Would it not be counterproductive in the fight against poverty for removing people from out of work to low paid and secure work? Uh, yes, of course I will listen to what are we going to do, what is best with uh, sanctions, because the key aim is not to give anybody sanctions. The key aim is to help people into work. That is what we need to do. But there has always been, since benefits began, a form of sanction regime, regime saying, if you're not living up to our expectations, this is what will happen. But it is minimal on JSA and even less on ESA, less than 1%. But what we do want to do is just make sure we uh, get people into work. And if you have suggestions, then I will meet with you. Philip Davis. Thank you, Mr Speaker. There's a lot of huffing and puffing from the uh, parties opposite, but not many solutions being offered. Given that the National Audit Office said that uh, the government should continue with universal credit, and that one of their criticisms was that it hadn't been rolled out quickly enough. Yes. Does my right honourable friend think that the opposition solution to pause universal credit in any way reflects the report from the National Audit Office? And can she continue with what she's doing, making improvements to universal credit? And I know that people in my constituency are grateful that one of the things that she's currently looking at is the issue regarding payment date and assessment periods. And so can I urge her to continue looking at the improvements that my constituents have suggested to her and not pause universal credit, which goes completely against what the NAO say? Uh, I want to thank my honourable friend because I went with him to his local Trussell Trust to see what other changes uh, we should be looking at. And one of them was that on the payment system for people in work. Because remember, this is the first time we've ever had a benefit system which is supporting people in work. Beforehand, it always been out of work. So I've pledged to look at that. The team is. Uh, and we are, as I said, supporting people. And he's quite right in, in what he says about the opposition. The NAO didn't say stop it. They said carry on and if everything, do it more quickly. But remember, this is the opposition who said about our changes in 2010, a million more people would be unemployed. Yeah. How wrong they were and how wrong they are again. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The NEO says that universal credit is more expensive, massively delayed, overly complex, and that the department will never be able to evidence that it helps more people work. The Secretary of State says everything's tickety-boo and that this is a personal tailor-made system based on the individual. Perhaps I could encourage the Secretary of State to meet my constituent Augustine, who didn't meet the minimum income floor uh, and expected earnings under universal credit and has been made homeless as a result. She could meet him in my local food bank, which has seen a tripling of the number of children they support as a direct result of universal credit rollout. Will she meet him? Direct pain. Well, um, a couple of things, starting off with the minimum income floor. And why this was brought in is because if people had set up a business and they're actually getting paid below minimum wage, with minimum wage they would get support to try and help them improve their business in the business case. But if that is still not working, it was to say, how do we help you become employed? Because obviously self-employment isn't working for you. And that's why the minimum income floor would have been uh, brought in. Uh, if anybody has been made homeless through this, then I will meet with them because we have advanced payments, we have support, our work coaches work with uh, homeless charities to do the exact opposite to that. In fact, I can tell you countless cases where they've stopped people being homeless. But if that has been the case, then we do need to listen to your constituent and get that changed rapidly. Donald. Mr Deputy Speaker, to enable people to get on in life and to open doors for opportunities is why I entered politics. Mm. Does my right hon. friend agree with me that universal credit is a fantastic example of this, given the fact that it does make work pay and it is forecasted to help 200,000 more people into work than job seekers' allowance? My hon. <laughs> my hon. Friend is right. Uh, she came into Parliament to help the most vulnerable in society. She came into Parliament to help people into work. That's what people this side of the House do. And that is what people on the opposite side of the House do. But our solutions 
Our ways of doing things are working. I have to reiterate the extra 3.2 million people in work since 2010. Universal credit has come about because the world has significantly changed even the last 10 years. Think about technology, automation, think about people online. The world has changed. We've got to deal with the gig economy, with flexible working hours, with part-time jobs, multiple jobs, and also the difference now in the working life. People with caring responsibility of children and of adults. And that is what this system takes into account, which the legacy system could not do. Jim Cunningham. Sure, Mr. Deputy Speaker. There may be a, a million more people in work, but there are also a million more, more people in poverty wages, for example. Having said that, whereas food banks were an exception to the rule, they have now become part of the rule. But more importantly, I have got constituents who I listen to, not the Secretary of State, who are on PIPs. They face delays. They face assessment delays. They don't know when they are going to be paid. It takes weeks and sometimes months. And it's great, great distress for them, and that adds to their illnesses or disabilities. Um, the Honourable Member um, raises a point, but let me clarify that it's three million more people over in work, not one million more. But what we did do, listening uh, to what uh, MPs said and local charities said, was bring in that extra support. So if anybody needs money straight away, that is why now there's a 100% advance straight away. That is why, as you move from one system to another system, there's an extra two weeks of housing benefit to help you do that. We are adapting to change to make this work. Stephen Kerr. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I would like to thank the Secretary of State for her statement and also thank the, my honourable friend, the member for North West Hampshire, who visited Stirling last week and held a roundtable meeting with yeah. Stirling uh, Citizens Advice Bureau, with our local food bank startup Stirling, and with Stirling Women's Aid. It was a very useful meeting, but it was also an example of the engagement and commitment of this team of ministers yes. to yeah. listen. Yeah. And I commend them for that. Can my right honourable friend spell out what steps have been taken to improve the claimant uh, experience in terms of the application and assessment process, especially for disabled claimants and those with special needs? Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And my honourable friend again talks about the commitment we've got, talks about the engagement that all of the ministers are doing and the department is doing and the work coaches are doing on a daily basis with local charities. And that is to get this as smooth uh, as possible. I talked about the extra 200 million going to local councils uh, as part of grant funding. 98% of councils has taken that money up. So they can make it easier for people, whether it's with disabilities or whether it's with just people who can't use IT. This is what we're doing to make the journey easier, and he's right to champion those people who need support. Um, we've heard that the Secretary of State is keen to meet with disabled groups and disabled people, and that's fantastic. But perhaps you could start by telling us how we're going to improve the payments that are made to disabled people that are always yeah. late, never on time, and yeah. never in full, which is borne out by our casework and some of the cases we heard yesterday in the Westminster Hall debate that I put on. Yeah. Um, the Honourable Lady says they're always late, well, never on time and not in full. This is absolutely uh, not correct whatsoever. What we do know, and if I didn't hear that right and the Honourable Lady said two-thirds, she's still wrong. Um, but what we need to uh, do is um, make sure these people get the support, and we know they are an extra £9 billion worth of support. So whether that's support because they need it financially, or whether it's support to get them into work, well, we know there are 600,000 more people in the work in the last few years. Access to work, we're helping even and more. So, really, uh, please look sometimes at the positive news and help your constituents a little bit more by focusing them to that more support. Yeah. Yeah. Mr Deputy Speaker, may I also assure the Secretary of State that I too have been to my local job centre and spoken to the staff there. I have heard that this is the best system, the best thing that's helping people for 30 years. Yeah. That is from the horse's mouth in Redditch. But yeah, yeah, Mr Deputy yeah. Speaker, I used to work in the software industry. The point about this system is it is an 
agile system. You cannot have a system on this scale that is built in the way that the party opposite suggests. That is not how technology operates. The benefit of this is that it can learn on an individual basis. As they put it to me in the job centre, it is different experience for every single claimant. That's how it responds. So the idea that you would stop it flies in the face of any kind of technology learning. Can, does she Sorry to the Honourable Lady. I want to get everybody in. It's got to be short and brief. Secretary of State. Well, it was, it was lovely listening to my uh, honourable friend and learned friend who knows so much about technology um, because those words needed to be heard. And as I said, it is the leading edge of technology. Great Britain is leading the way. Countries who are coming to see us range from Sweden to United States to Italy to New Zealand to Spain to Canada to Cyprus to France to Denmark wanting to know how it works to take it back home to their countries. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, when the former Secretary of State was assuring the House that universal credit implementation was going well, it was the National Audit Office that told us what was really happening. Its reports have never been shoddy, they've never been scaremongering, they have embarrassed ministers, that's true, but they've proved to be truthful. And the Secretary of State will recognise many of the findings of this latest NEO report from warnings given from this side of the House when she was in the department four or five years um, ago. The central flaw, of course, is the very long wait that people have before they're entitled to receive cash. Her predecessor, only in the job for a short time, greatly to his credit, he managed to reduce the waiting time from six weeks to five. Will she commit to build on that progress and reduce the waiting time significantly further? Um, well, I've heard the warnings from the opposition before. I heard the warnings even about work experience, sector-based work academies. Oh, we couldn't do that for our young people. We did, and youth unemployment dropped by over 43%. So I've heard the warnings, and I appreciate the opposition don't like the way we do things, but the way we do things provides results. Hence, a 1,000 people in work every day since 2010. But what I will agree with him on is my predecessor made significant changes in how we were rolling out this system and waiting times we have to uh, make sure they're reduced as much as possible but I have to say uh, we know two thirds of those uh, waiting times is due to a lack of verification we need the verification to know if people are legally entitled to benefits I could Deputy Speaker, I'd like to pick up on the point made by my honourable friend, the member for Shipley, because he's right. The National Audit Office report um, says that the universal credit rollout is slow, and yet the parties opposite want to slow it down even further or even, pa or even pause it. In noting that obvious tension, does my right honourable friend agree that the pace of the rollout and also the test and learn approach means that the system is continually improving and that people will always have the opportunity to get into work and be better off in work. Uh, my honourable friend is again correct. The NAO made clear that the pace could do with speeding up. It also said continue with universal credit, far from what the opposition is saying. They said speed up pace, carry on going. That's what the NAO said. And they also said progress had been made in what we're doing. Please read it. Governor Jones. I've been visited uh, the DBUP uh, offices in Stanley and Chester Street in my North Durham constituency. Can I agree with one thing to the, to the, with the Secretary of State and that's say thank you to the staff for their work. But there is a real fear uh, that has been raised to me by constituents who have poor IT skills. So what more can we do to support these individuals and also uh, expand the uh, access to IT? Because many libraries exact have for being closed or restricted hours. And that, I think, is a stumbling block for a lot of those individuals. Um, I want to uh, thank the uh, Honourable Member for mentioning work coaches in such a positive way because they are doing a significant amount of work and I only hear praise wherever I go. Um, this uh, need to give people support, whether it's IT or debt, but definitely with IT, support is there. 200 million has gone to uh, local authorities, but the job centre can point you in the right direction. So please go via the job centre and they will point those claimants in the right direction. Kate Green. 
Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. Last week I met a constituent at my surgery who had received just £11 for four hours of work as a result of less generous earnings disregards and a sharper clawback of council tax debt than under legacy benefits. So can the Secretary of State say what estimate she's made of those features in terms of the continuing employment benefits that she has talked about and whether we can help her to approach the Chancellor as he prepares his autumn budget to put money into the universal credit system to improve the earnings disregards and to lower the rate at which other debt is recovered. Uh, my, uh, uh, the Honourable Lady has a great deal of knowledge in this area. I am more than happy to meet with her so that we can ensure that we have a continuous learning and continuous improvement. And I am looking closely at the debt repayment uh, that uh, she talks about. This is something that is uh, I am focused on very much at the moment. So I would, um, uh, I was going to say, love to meet her with her. I will. I love to meet with her. <laughs> David um, uh, despite what the uh, Right Honourable Lady says, some 40% of individuals are still not able to access because of verification failures, because of lack of IT. Now, in rural areas such as mine, it may be six to ten miles to the nearest town or to the nearest job centre. What steps can she take to improve verification for individuals who cannot access computers and cannot get to a job centre or a town easily? Uh, the Honourable Member again raises a fair point on how do we do that um, connection there. And what we're really focusing on now, as we continue with this uh, sort of continuous improvement, is outreach work to those people who are um, most in need or most isolated, uh, maybe in a rural community. How do we help them and get the support they need? So that's, again, a part of our continuous improvement. Jobs. Speaker. Hull is one of the cities to see uh, the rollout of universal credit later this year. We already have high levels of uh, poverty and homelessness and people using food banks. And I wanted to know from the Secretary of State, after the uh, report's been published, what she plans to do, what other measures does she plan to introduce to make sure that when universal credit is rolled out in Hull, it is more successful than it has been so far? We will make sure it continues uh, being successful where it goes, with more people in work quicker, faster, staying in work, getting progress in work. On average, people will get £600 a month more in work through the extra support the work coaches are getting. And again, I would uh, ask her too to go to her job centre to find out what is going on and how we are helping people. Very much. I'm very disappointed the Minister is blind to the hardship that's being caused by this policy. Uh, last night in my constituency, a number of constituents, including two of my staff, were involved in trying to raise money through a, a sponsored run for the East Durham Trust Food Bank. That food bank was completely depleted. And can I point out to the Minister respectfully, the reason that that food bank is depleted is because of the policies of this Government, in particular the introduction of universal credit delayed PIP appeals and sanctions that have been applied to my constituents. Um, I would uh, like to say to the Honourable Member, I am certainly not blind to hardship. We all come into this House trying to prevent hardship. We on this side of the House believe that you stop prevent poverty and hardship by getting people into work, to support them in work, to allow them to fulfil their dreams, hopes, ambitions, whatever you'd like to say. So that is what we do this side of the House. And like I said, for the most vulnerable, we have provided significantly more money, particularly for those with disability and health conditions. That's what we want to do, support people into work and reduce poverty. Current. As a former member of the Public Accounts Committee, I am very conscious of how much that committee, indeed the House, relies on the National Audit Office reports and remind the House that the Department does agree with the Audit Office the veracity of those reports. Where there are issues, then the Department can follow those up in the Public Accounts Committee. 
Can I ask particularly about habitual residency tests con connected with universal credit claims? I've got a constituent who's now been refused advance payment due to a delay in her partner's residency test. And it's not clear when this will be com completed. It would be helpful to understand the timescales for the residency test. And can the Minister confirm if the partner fails the, the residency test, will an entirely new claim have to be made? Um, what we don't agree with in the NAO is obviously all of its conclusions because they didn't take into account the impact. Some of the conclusions we agree with, and that is continue with the rollout and uh, uh, speed it up, and also the progress that has been made. With regards to the habitual residency test, again, that is to make sure that you're, you should be legally entitled to a benefit. Verification was increased in uh, 1994 and again tightened in 2004 and if you fail the habitual residency test you can come back and reapply uh, when you have been here and shown that you have links to the country here uh, uh, again when you a couple of months later three months Mr. Mr. Deputy Speaker, and can I first of all assure the Secretary of State that I have read the NAO report yes. in full, because I like to know what I'm speaking about. But I also like to know the lived experience of my constituents in Bladen, where we have full rollout of universal credit. It happened just before Christmas. And I have to say the NAO report does reflect the problems that my constituents face with late payments, with, um, with delays in, um, you know, caused by uh, all kinds of problems. Sorry, I've lost my train there. <laughs> but it certainly does reflect the problems that my constituents are having. And uh, in particular, I'd like to refer to the problem that some constituents are having who have uh, disabilities. For example, a local voluntary organisation came to see me recently to talk about problems that a, a deaf person was having. In, uh, even with support in claiming universal credit, and also uh, people with. Um, yeah. So the question is two things. One, will she look at the provisions for people with disabilities in ensuring that they are able to claim easily? And secondly, does she intend to uh, follow any of the recommendations of the NAO report? Well, uh, we both agree it is important that people who are the most in need uh, get uh, the most support, and that's what we're doing. You know, we're training more staff in uh, different, whether it's disability needs, whether it's working uh, with various other char uh, charities to make sure that happens. But again, uh, Caroline here from uh, talks about... Uh, access to work and mental health support. She's had bipolar disorder all her life, but now she's finally found a system that is helping her into work, listening to her. That's what our work coaches are about. So, yes, we are helping more disabled people. Dr David. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Last week in Prime Minister's Questions, I identified that the waiting time for appeals for PIP were 41 weeks and for ESA 30 weeks in the Gloucester area. What will the Secretary of State do to make sure that universal credit appeals don't further delay the appeal time whereby people can try and get some justice? Um, I, I heard the Honourable uh, Member raise uh, this the other week and I wanted to reassure him that we're obviously working with the MOJ to increase the number of judges and increase the number of people on tribunal panels and we're also recruiting 150 presiding officers to make sure we understand what's going on and make the system smoother and quicker and we obviously need to make sure that happens both for PIP, ESA and obviously should we need it for UC. Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, what, a, what an utterly contemptible and triumphant statement we've just heard from the Secretary of State. With the brassiest of necks, she boasts of the changes to universal credit that members on these benches have continually called for, many of which this Government was dragged through the courts before making. Universal credit will be rolled out across Renfrewshire in September. Can I ask the Secretary of State to please, please pause the rollout, fix the multitude of problems we've heard today before the people of Renfrewshire are made to suffer the consequences? Um, if the Honourable Member had been calling for some of the changes uh, that I've just done, then surely he should be celebrating along with me that we have done those changes because we've listened. That's what it's about. It's about getting it right for the citizen, not just opposing just for opposing sake.
Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. My constituents who are now on personal dependence payment who previously qualified for disability living allowance are losing £2 million a year in my constituency as a result of a freedom of information request. So what will the Minister do to address that obvious failure? More people now are getting more money on uh, PIP than they ever got on DLA. Every year since 2010, right the way through to 2022, more people will be getting more support and also on the higher rates of support. Elie Reeves. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Universal credit will be rolled out in my constituency in July. I already deal with lots of constituents needing help getting the benefits they are entitled to due to unnecessary barriers put up by the DWP. The reality is that half of claimants are unable to make a claim for universal credit online without assistance. So what real assurance will the Secretary Secretary of State give my constituency? Because I have heard little today that gives us confidence in the rollout. Well, what it is doing is making it a much simpler system. It's taking six benefits and making it into one. So instead of your constituent having to go to get housing benefit from the local council, instead of trying to get tax credits from uh, HMRC, instead of it having to also go to DWP, it means it can get it all under one roof and streamline it. So again, if you'd care to go in with your constituent into a job centre, they could see how it now works. Stephen. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I appreciate being given the opportunity to intervene because I was unavoidably detained and missed the Minister's uh, early part of the statement. Uh, Listening to the Minister's answers, uh, uh, it really basically seems to appear that anything that the NAO report says uh, positive is a good thing, and the Minister agrees with it. The whole stream of things that the NAO say are a real problem with universal credit are completely dismissed out of hand. I think that is unwise. My question, though, is does the Minister agree with me that uh, if the three billion per annum that had been in universal credit at the time of the coalition, which I powerfully and fiercely supported, despite putting my caveats on the record about some issues of universal credit, if that three billion was still per annum was still within universal credit, work really would pay and it would be a substantially successful benefit. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, what we've said is that the NAO report sadly was out of date and therefore it hasn't taken into account all of the changes that have been brought in, which is unfortunate. Therefore, it isn't a true reflection of what is happening. And uh, it was unfortunate he wasn't here uh, for the statement, but maybe he could read it uh, tomorrow when Hansard comes out and he will have his answers on how well the system is working. Just uh, is it exceptional to actually take a point forward because normally we come after service. But as it relates to this, yes, I will take that point forward. I'm, I'm grateful to you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, the uh, Secretary of State, in response to my question, is incorrectly said that the government hadn't been found to have acted unlawfully in relation to universal credit as it applies to severely disabled people. I have looked up this judgment. I was at Court 28 when it was handed down this time last week. And it is absolutely the case that for disabled people transitioning onto universal credit, severely disabled people, the government was found to have acted unlawfully and to uh, discriminatory. I, I appreciate that we, if we could correct the record, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Yeah. Yeah. Like to come back. Uh, because if you read and you were uh, supposedly uh, there at the judgment, then. I, I'm giving the uh, Honourable Lady a get out clause. Um, it's because on many of the points the government actually won and it was moving area that it was questioned about and in that case how it had uh, impacted on people with severe disability premium but it was not about the fundamental change which I have done to help half a million disabled people and that is to now give transitional protection to people with uh, severe disability premium which is different. Speaker, there were two judgments. The one that I have just stated about uh, severely disabled people transitioning onto universal credit was upheld, and the Secretary of State needs to recognise that. I'm going to leave it at that because it's certainly been put on the record, it's been heard. I want to now move on to the Ministerial Statement. Minister of State for Immigration, Caroline.